Last weekend we were in Wisconsin, had a good time with family out there, I haven't seen some of them in years. It was good to be out there. Um, it was a little strange when we went to church on Sunday to be sitting there listening to somebody else preach. It was a little different for me, but I did notice one thing. Hawkins stayed awake the entire time during his sermon. <laughs> he sleeps every Sunday, but last week at somebody else's sermon he paid attention. So We've been really busy traveling back and forth. We've got a lot of stuff going on this week too, but um, we appreciate all your prayers and all those things. As, uh, as I was getting ready for this, I was thinking about it all week and, and putting it together. Um, we're going to talk about one part of the Trinity that I think gets ignored a lot. And I've got some, some statistics for us there, but we have a tendency sometimes to forget about the Holy Spirit. We don't mention the Holy Spirit out loud very often. We talk, we pray in Jesus' name, we talk about God, but sometimes we kind of let the Spirit slide off to the side. So I want to talk about the importance of the Spirit and who the Spirit is. So before we get started, let's just go to the Lord in prayer here. Father God, I thank you so much for all that are gathered here today, Lord. And I ask you, I ask you a blessing on this church and on this time. I ask you your blessing on our worship. And Lord, I just pray that our hearts and our minds and our ears are open to the, to the word that you want us to have today, Lord. I pray that you give me the words that you want to be spoken. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so, go ahead, Gab. This really bothered me. I read this, and it really, really bothered me. There was a study done this year, 2021, by the cultural research, it's a cultural research survey from Arizona Christian University. It's a national survey. And the question was, are you a Christian? That was question number one. 69% of the people that answered said yes. But there's a challenge to that, because you narrow it down a little bit, and they said yes, they were Christians, but when they were asked, are you born again Christians, it drops to a smaller number. And then they the, got even smaller from the born-again Christians. The next step was, do you have a Christian worldview? Smaller percentage, it's getting narrower. Then the theological Christian. A theological Christian is one that believes Romans. If you repent with your mouth, or confess with your mouth, mouth and um, repent, that's the theological worldview. That's smaller than the born-agains again, and it's smaller than the Christian worldview. And then the last category here, is someone who identifies as having a biblical worldview. That their worldview is based upon the Bible. That's the smallest percentage, and these are all people. These all fall within the, yes, I'm a Christian. It just went smaller and smaller and smaller. That's how people define themselves being a Christian. That's not really what bothered me, because everybody defines different things, and if you're asked a survey, sometimes it's hard when you're asked a survey to be specific about all these things, you know, you're on the phone for a short period of time. What bothered me is this next statistic. This statement, the Holy Spirit is not real, it's just a symbol of God's power, presence, and virtue, was an option. Overall, 58% of the people that identified as Christians said that's what they believe. That the Holy Spirit is not real, it's just a symbol. When you get to the born again, 62% of the people that identified as being born again Christians said they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a real entity in and of itself. Christians with a worldview, 50%. Theological Christians, 50%. Half of them did not believe the, the Holy Spirit was a real being, a real entity, a real person in and of itself. And even the biblical worldview, which you would think is probably the most orthodox, most doctrinally sound, probably. Even in that group, there was 39% that did not believe that the Holy Spirit was real. Oh my. That scares me a little bit. You identify as a Christian, but you only believe in two parts of the Trinity? I thought that was kind of fundamental. I thought that was foundational. I thought that was automatic. And then I read this and I go, whoa. Maybe we're not talking about the Holy Spirit enough. Maybe we're not addressing that enough. Maybe we don't get into our Bibles and look at that enough. So I'm going to get into the Word today, and we're going to talk about that. This is the first mention that I want to bring up here. It's not the first mention of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that. But this is the first mention that I want to talk about. This is Jesus talking to his disciples before he ascends in John 14. 
verses 15 through 17, it says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. All right, so if, if the Holy Spirit is not a real entity, why is Jesus saying he? Why is Jesus saying, some, you're going to get someone to replace me? I was with you physically, I won't be with you physically, but there will be someone with you physically. If someone's going to be with us physically, they have to be a physical entity. And if Jesus said that, how can we doubt that? that it, it baffles me. <coughs> this is kind of an interesting thing here. Jesus told the disciples to wait because the advocate was coming. So in Acts 2, 1 through 4, it talks about Pentecost. And as we go into this, I want you to pay attention to what it says about Pentecost, and then I'm going to bring a little context behind it again. You know I love my history. So in Acts 2, 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly it sounded like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The Holy Spirit descends. Like Jesus said, it's coming. When the Advocate comes, He will fill you. You will be indwelt with that. Now, if we look at the Old Testament, I didn't put any verses up here because I just ran out of time. But in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit manifests Himself regularly as well. But it's temporary. Every time someone is filled with the Spirit, it's for one activity. Samson was filled with the Spirit when he tore down the when he tore the pillars down. There's other times when the prophets were filled with the Spirit and they performed miracles. Those things happened. But the Spirit coming down and indwelling and living with us is something that only happened after Jesus. So this this time was when the Spirit first descended. Jesus said, I have to leave. So that this, so the advocate can come, so the Holy Spirit can come. Um, I don't have anything against the King James Version of the Bible, but there is one thing that kind of hangs around from the King James. That's the first and only time that the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Ghost. And I think some people, that's why they take the Holy Spirit and kind of disassemble it into something that's just kind of a fantasy because they say ghost. Well, that's not what's meant. It is a spirit. Holy Spirit is someone different. Now, context here is kind of interesting. Pentecost comes from the Greek for the word 50. That's what that is. Pente is 5. Pentecost is 50. Shavuot, Shavuot, we talked about that, is called the Festival of Weeks. The Festival of Weeks was 50 days after Passover. Pentecost existed as something people would identify as Pentecost before Jesus. And the festival of weeks is the time when the law was sent down to Israel. That's the time they celebrate getting the instruction from God on how to live. <coughs> and I don't think that none, nothing God does is accidental. But if Pentecost was celebrated by the Jewish people as the time that God gave them the law and taught them how to live, the Holy Spirit comes down and brings as an advocate to teach us how to live. Amen. There's, not a, there's no mistake in God. But sometimes we don't know this context behind. I thought it was very interesting. I thought Pentecost was just a New Testament thing. No, it's been there all along. It was a celebrated thing. It was 50 days after Passover was Pentecost. Which again fits the biblical timeline exactly because Jesus, during Passover, Jesus was crucified. When he was resurrected, he walked around for 40 days. After he left, they had to wait a couple of days until Pentecost. Why didn't the Holy Spirit descend when Jesus ascended? Why wasn't it automatic? Because they were waiting for this day. Because of the significance of this and the meaning behind it. And if we don't know our history and we don't know some of those things, we lose some meaning, we lose some understanding. So, what is the benefit of the Holy Spirit? Why is the Holy Spirit necessary? What do we get out of this, this concept? Jesus was here and left the Word. We have the Bible. Why, why the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus himself said in John 16, 7 through 11, he says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Again, 
How can we think the Holy Spirit's not real when Jesus says, it's going to benefit you for me not to be with you anymore? Because something different is coming. And that difference is the fact that the Holy Spirit came into us. He says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world is the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. This is what the Holy Spirit does when he comes and indwells us. Is we get an understanding of everything else that has happened. Think about the disciples. How many times when Jesus is walking with the disciples did he say, Can you explain that to us? Can you help us understand that? We don't understand how to do this. Teach us how to pray. They're sitting right there with Jesus and they need his help to do all those things. And Jesus said, well, i got to leave because when I leave, your teacher is coming. The one who's going to help you understand these things. The one who's going to be able to guide you through things. The advocate. The give you knowledge. Give you wisdom. All of those things come from the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, we would be missing an awful lot. So the biggest benefit for us, Jesus said, is He's going to come into you. You were with me, but He is coming into you. He's coming into you, and He's going to live in you, and He's going to be there with you. And this is really, I think, one of the first times that, that the concept of a personal relationship really comes out. We have a personal relationship with Christ, but we also have that personal relationship because we are indwelt with one of the Trinity inside us. That's important. And it can't be dismissed by saying it's just, you know, it's just a symbol of something. It's not a symbol. It's active. The Holy Spirit is active in our lives. The role of the Holy Spirit, John 16, uh, 12 through 15, again, Jesus says, I have more to say, much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus said, I have more than you can possibly handle to tell you right now. I have. There is more knowledge. There is more depth. There is more that you could possibly gain. He's talking to disciples that walked with him on the earth and saying, you're not even close to getting it yet. You don't understand it all. And I don't have the ability or the time to tell you it all. But I'm going to send you someone who will, who will guide you through this concept. And this last part where he says, he will glorify me because it is from me. He will receive what he will make known to you. Jesus speaks through the Spirit. And then it says, all that belongs to the Father is mine. God speaks through the Spirit. When we're learning about God, we're learning about Jesus, the Spirit is there to help us understand those things. Again, a physical presence is there to help us understand these things. Without the Spirit, we would not understand it. We wouldn't get it. It would have ended when Jesus ascended. And he said, oh, you haven't got even the beginning of it yet. You wait. When I leave, it's good for you because when I leave, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful thing. So what is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? We hear those terms. What does the indwelling of the Holy Spirit mean? What that means is that when we accept Christ, when we confess and are baptized, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings us things that we do not have without Him. And there's a lot of that stuff involved here. But I want to show you one. I, I thought this was really interesting passages here. Luke 4, 1 through 2. This is Jesus right after his baptism. Jesus, after his baptism, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Jesus, after his baptism, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what granted him the power to do what he did. Fully God, fully man, but he did not start his ministry until after his baptism. That's what started it. And he followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, but if it's good enough for Jesus, I'll be good enough for you. 
sure good enough for me. If that's enough for Jesus to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, that should tell you something. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one Spirit to drink. The same thing. Just like Jesus gained His power and Jesus was led by the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit as well. And once that happened, through the Spirit... We see the New Testament church coming out filled with the Holy Spirit. We see God's kingdom being manifest through that church. There was no separation of anybody. There was no class. There was no system of anything. It says right there, Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, none of that matters anymore. If the Holy Spirit indwells you, nothing on the outside matters. It's what's inside that matters. And when that happens, we're set free. We're set free because the Holy Spirit comes inside us. That's where it comes from. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that a little bit. Matthew 8, 29 through, or 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. You ought to know this one. This is a great commission. And it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Again, how can someone claim to be a theological Christian... Claim to be have a biblical world worldview. Claim to be a, claim to be a Christian at all, and not realize that there's three things mentioned here. This is our Trinity: the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It doesn't say the Father and Son and whatever the, whatever that other one is. It says the Spirit. There, it is specifically listed: the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. When we baptize someone, we baptize them in the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It is a three, it's a trinity. It's three parts in one. When we do that, and you are baptized, you, and you accept Christ into your life, you allow the Holy Spirit to indwell you, and that's where the teaching comes. And Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit descends on you, go and baptize. When you have the Spirit in you, then you go and put it in other people. Put the Holy Spirit, put, bring Him into the lives of others. That's why we're meant to go forth and evangelize and baptize and preach to other people. It's because we are bringing what we receive to other people. We share that. And it's not just our Bible, but it's also the Holy Spirit that needs to be shared and needs to be spread. Because the Holy Spirit is living and active right now in our lives. And that's a Christian. A true Christian has that. Again, those statistics just drive me crazy because I don't understand this. Like Jesus said, it is so simple. Everything is laid out so simply. But sometimes that simplicity baffles the wise. I don't understand. Acts 19, 5-7. This is Paul, and he's talking to 12 disciples, believers. But those are believers that went through John's baptism, and they, they never heard of the Holy Spirit before. So they predated Jesus getting baptized. They predated Jesus' teaching. And they, they kind of understood, but they didn't understand this Holy Spirit. It hadn't been mentioned to them before. So Paul says, on hearing this, he explains it to them. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. These were men who had, a, had the beginning of, of the process, but hadn't completed it through accepting Christ into their lives and understanding that the Holy Spirit indwells them. Paul baptizes them, and when he baptizes them and his hands touch them, the Holy Spirit is, is indwells them. And they get it. They finally get it all together. There are a lot of people out there. I, uh, I shared, I think Jeff's the one that I first saw put it up. Satan believes in Christ. It doesn't make him a Christian. Believing in Christ is not enough. Yes, I believe he existed. Yeah, so do all the demons. That does not make them a follower. That does not make them a follower of Jesus Christ. What makes you a follower is the indwelling of the Spirit. Believing is one thing. Accepting the Spirit is completely different. So you can say, yeah, I kind of believe. I know who he was. That doesn't do you any good at all. It has to go beyond that. And that's where the Spirit becomes so important. One of the things about the Spirit that we need to understand is that the power of God is manifest on earth through the Holy Spirit. Like I said, in the Old Testament, we see that come in flashes. 
the Spirit will fill somebody and boom. If you look at the prophets and some of the things that they did, they were filled by the Holy Spirit and boom. But during those times, they didn't hang, the Holy Spirit didn't stay. He was just there intermittently. Now he is permanent. When you accept the Holy Spirit into you, he is there all the time. And the power of the Spirit is what acts. So in Acts 10, 37-38, it says, You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing who were under all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Again, blatantly clear. Why was Jesus able to heal and cast out demons? Because Jesus was indwelled with the Holy Spirit. He was not alone either. And Jesus said later on to his disciples, he said, you're going to do even greater things than I am. Why was that possible? It's the power of the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Power. The power to do here on earth comes from the Spirit. Without Him, we don't have the power. That is, that is God's conduit to give us the strength. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes over you. This is Jesus again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria, Jerusalem, and the ends of the earth. You will receive power. You are not the weak vessel you were in the past. You are not incomplete. But we are completed in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that grants us the ability to do things that we can't do on our own. There are so many things about the Holy Spirit. I could sit up here and preach about the Holy Spirit for about 48 hours nonstop. But none of y'all would stay that long, no matter how much coffee we have. The Holy Spirit is, is in the New Testament, is, there's so much about the Spirit. There's so much. I brought some of the things out here, but you could do studies, and there are studies, and there are books, and there are tons of things about the Holy Spirit. There's lots of research to do, and I'm hoping that in doing this sermon today, I kind of tease your appetite a little bit. I want you hungry. I want you to get hungry for the Spirit so that you reach out and seek Him yourself. Because I can't force that on you. Nobody can. And just like your salvation, it's a personal thing. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else can suggest it. And you're not covered by anybody else's personal beliefs. It's your own. So I hope you seek the Spirit through this. So what's the role of the Spirit today? We read in the Old Testament, we read in the New Testament about the power of the Spirit coming down, those kind of things. What does the Spirit do for us today, right here, right now, for each of us in our own lives? Go ahead, Deb. John 16, 8, it says, When He comes, He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The conviction of the sin of the world in us personally so we understand the difference. We understand the sin of the world, and we understand God's will. The Holy Spirit brings that conviction and, and gives us the ability to separate those two things so we can see truth. The Spirit of truth is another name for the Holy Spirit. It is the ability to understand what's right and what's wrong. To see it and to live the way God wants us to live. In addition, Romans 8 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If, the, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not finished, you are not complete as a Christian. So again, that survey saying they don't believe it's real, I challenge their faith. I don't think it exists. Unless you understand and believe and feel the Spirit moving in your life, you're not complete yet. So when he says here, we're not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. Once that happens, that conviction, that understanding of the sin of the world, that understanding of the blessings of God and the way He wants us to, to live, the way He wants us to receive Him, the way He wants us to exist in this place, in this time that we are in right now today, comes from the Holy Spirit. So the role in our life is obviously pretty clear. It says right there, if you're not in the Spirit, then you're not of Christ. Simple. I just put this one down here because I, I wanted to bring this in. Another role of the Spirit 
I didn't put all the verses in here. It's about spiritual gifts, and we talked about that. The spiritual gifts that we are given are meant to edify the body of Christ, to edify the church. People get different spiritual gifts. Those come from the Holy Spirit. It's not a gift that you were born with. It's something you receive from God. He bestows the gifts of God on us for the benefit of the kingdom of God. All those spiritual gifts, you can go through the whole list. We do all that. I've done sermons on it before. Those are gifts from the Spirit. Another thing that He continues to give. This isn't past tense. This is present tense. The Holy Spirit is not past tense. The Holy Spirit is present. Present tense. Right here, right now. Okay. So, application. All right. I always try and give some sort of application in the end. I'll give you some verses on what this means to us in our lives. How does the Holy Spirit manifest Himself in us personally, and how do we seek that? Because we need to seek it. The Bible says there's, there's one unforgivable sin. What's the one unforgivable sin? Which sounds like a strange thing. To blaspheme the Spirit. No slack in that. The Holy Spirit is here for a purpose. He is in your life. That means He is speaking to you and He is speaking through from God to you, speaking through, through uh, that realm to us. Now, in doing so, just like any other speaking, you have the ability to not listen. I just spent, we went to Wisconsin, came back Monday night, uh, had Tuesday off. Wednesday went out, Hawk got his new adjustments on his wheelchair, they widened it, new cushions, it's awesome. And then Thursday I took off and I went up to Montana. And I spent a couple days with my grandkids and taught some classes, drew some horses, did all that kind of stuff. What I am noticing, and some of you may have seen this, especially if you have a strong-willed child, with my grandson, who will be four next month, he has very selective hearing. <laughs> if he's doing something and he doesn't want to stop doing it, his mother can tell him anything she wants, and he is just absolutely oblivious to her. He will just shut her out and won't pay any attention. And there's times when he does hear her and say, no. Hey, did you go get me this? No, I'm busy. No, I have something to do. No, I, 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 no. I'm just, mom, no. It was interesting. I know she's doing it right because Friday night she was making tacos and she was stirring the, the meat with a wooden spoon. And she said, watch this. She said, hey, Weston, what's this? He looked up from the table and went, ah, that's a spanking spoon. <laughs> looked back down. I think she's raising him right occasionally, but he's got, we all have middle names for a reason, right? That's so mom can yell at you and you know it's serious. When they get to the middle name, you're in trouble. Or, like my wife would say, your son, he's no longer her child when he's in trouble. He's always mine when he's in trouble. The Holy Spirit's the same way. He speaks to us, but we have the ability, we have the free will again, that God gave us to shut him up. Not that he stops talking, but we stop listening. And I think that's where a lot of Christians can get themselves into trouble, is when we start to ignore the Spirit. We start to ignore the conviction when it comes into your heart that this is something you should be doing or this is something you shouldn't be doing or this is what God wants to say to you today. We'll get into those situations where sometimes we want to just tune that one out. It's not convenient for us at this moment in time. I want to shut it off. I'll turn you back on later. That's not, a, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes we fall into that, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. What is our application here? First one in here is that we are considered temples of the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Spirit. What does that mean? Treat it with reverence. We clean the church, right? We mow the lawn. We keep the lights on. We do all those things. It's all right. We'll fix it. Jane signed up and forgot to check this week. We are taking care of this building because it's important to us. Because we spend our time coming in here and worshiping and doing Bible studies and going to church and doing those things, this is, we can, a lot of people will call their building the house of God, right? Well, because you are indwelt, you are also the house of God. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. What you do with your body is a reflection of who you are and who you understand to be inside of you. 
The other thing here, we're going on in Galatians here, is we need to walk the walk. We're supposed to walk the, by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with, one, with each other. So you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What that means very simply is, if we follow the Spirit, there is no condemnation in Christ. If we ignore the Spirit and decide to choose the world, well, you're back under that, that the conviction of the law again. There's the difference. If we are following the Spirit, if we're walking the walk and not just talking the talk, we should be separated from the world. We're in it, but not of it. If we are of the world, then we're not listening to the Spirit because there's a conflict. Jesus said, you're, you're either for me or you're against me. There's no in-between. There's no gray matter. Either you're this or you're that. That's it. And he, Paul is saying the same thing right here. If you're following the Spirit, the world is not in you. If you are following the world, the Spirit is not in you. Another application for us. Go ahead, Gav. We are called to pray in the Spirit. Uh, Jude one twenty says, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. If God is speaking to us through the Spirit, we should be speaking to God through the Spirit. It's a two-way connection. We, when we pray, if we are praying in the Spirit, we are praying through our advocate. The word advocate that Jesus used there means someone who stands up for you. In Spanish, avocado means avocado, not avocado. No D in there. Advocate is a word for lawyer. So if someone is your advocate, they're speaking up for you. You don't know what to say, he'll translate it. Why do we have lawyers in court? Sometimes I don't understand, but the purpose of them is to speak in the language that the judges understand, right? Ever try to understand legalese? As an English teacher, it drives me nuts because they... It's all impersonal, all the, all the legal language. Average person, they don't really get that. I think the judges and the lawyers do that just so that they get paid. But you have to have someone who speaks the language to represent you. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit, we're speaking in the way God understands. And it goes back and forth. And He advocates for us. And He helps us. We should be sealed in the Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, Paul says... And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That is the mark of Christ in your life. The indwelling of the Spirit is the mark of Christ. You are now wearing, by the indwelling of the Spirit, you are now wearing the mark, the seal of Christ. What's a seal? Well, historically, we, we, we think about it, it's a mark identifying something. We have the same thing here right now in South Dakota. We call it a brand. If you've got a brand on something, it's yours. Why do you have to have a brand inspector come before you sell something? They come through and make sure that the seal on your cows are yours. Before you sell them, you identify that these are mine. There's, you can see it. It's marked on them. The horses, the cows are all marked because... We want to identify who they are, who they belong to. The Holy Spirit is our brand. It's our seal. It's the mark of Christ on you. The other thing that the Holy Spirit brings to us, and we need to include in our own application of that, is we have hope. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, that power... The power of hope. That's an amazing thing. And as Christians, we should be poster children for hope, right? It should be a big deal for us. Come on in, come on in. James, we're waiting for you. Go ahead. Give the hug, Jane. We have hope only through Christ. Without Christ, there is no hope. You want to... You wanna, Definition of that, you want to visit that, walk outside the doors and meet the people that are sitting outside in, in houses around us right now. If they don't have Christ in their life, they are they have no hope. 
Life gets tough and it stays tough. Life brings you down, you stay down. Life knocks you down, you don't get back up. We have hope, and through the grace and mercy of God, because of His, because of His daily grace, we have hope and can come back to Him every single day. That hope is manifest, as it says right here, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to that. Apply that in your, lo your own life. Understand that the Spirit is waiting to give you hope, to give you the Word, to give you what God wants you to have. And 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. The other thing that we have through the Spirit that we need to apply in our lives is joy. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message of the, in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We sing that song, right? The joy of the Spirit comes through the understanding of who you are, who He is, and what our relationship is with God. And the Spirit brings that relationship to life in us. When you're down... You go into the Spirit, you ain't down anymore. When you are suffering, when times are tough, when things are things are rough, and you go to the Spirit, and you are filled with the Spirit, you will find joy and not sadness and not suffering and not pain. No matter what else is going on in your life. Because we have the hope of a future with Jesus and, and, and Jesus Christ, because of His resurrection, we have the hope of the future of heaven. This is just a blink. This is just a blink in time. Our life here is short. Eternity is an awful lot longer than that. Because we have the promise of that hope, we can find joy even though we're here for this blink of time, even if it stinks to be here. And I don't care who you are, at some point in your life, it's going to stink to be here. Sometimes this world will get you so hard that you wish you weren't here. And God says, ah, but I want you there right now because you're going to come with me later. And if you go to the Spirit, the Spirit gives you comfort. That's one of the names of the Spirit, is the Comforter. But if we don't apply this in our lives, if we're not listening to the Spirit, if we're not paying attention to it, we're missing all these things. We're missing the seal of Christ. We're missing hope. We're missing joy. We're missing out because we don't apply the Spirit into our lives, because we don't use the power given to us by God when He sent the Spirit to indwell us. If we're not using it, we're not receiving. We, it's a free gift. God loved us so much that he sent his son. And his son said, i got to leave because you've got something even better coming to be with you while you're here on this earth. And everything I say, he's going to understand and tell you. And everything you tell him, he's telling me. It's all going back and forth. You have the ability to do all these things. We've been given such a gift. And yet, we also have the free will to ignore it. So my, my simple application here is simply use what you've been given. Use what's there. I've told people, most of you know, I don't write my sermons until Sunday mornings. Five o'clock I get up, I write my sermon. That's because I've written them on Wednesday and then I don't use them on Sunday because God gives me something else to say on Sunday and I just have to throw that one out. I've got... Uh, friends of mine that are pastors, and they write their entire down word, sermon down word for word. And they can put it in a file. And it's word for word. Everything they said is right there. When I first uh, came up here, I had one of these pastors come to me and say, do you want my sermons? He says, I got, I got some boxes full of sermons. And I said, I, I, I can't do it that way. I said, that's not the way I do it. I didn't teach like that in school. I can't do it that way here either. That's my sermon. That's everything I had when I came here. And all that is is the verses we put up there. I come up here and I listen to, to the Spirit and I try and let the Spirit speak through me. I have no idea what I'm going to say until I get up here. And I let God speak. Sometimes in my life I shut God out too. Sometimes during the week I'm not listening the way I should be. And I have to remind myself to listen. Sometimes I wake up Sunday morning and I don't know what to preach. And I pray in the Spirit and I say, Lord, just open your word up to me. Tell me what you want. And it comes. If you ask, you receive. If you put yourself out there, you will get what God wants you to get. You will receive the blessings that come from the Holy Spirit. 
but you got to be active and participate. This is a relationship. It's two way. You got to get there. You got to do your share. You got to do your part. It's simple. It's simple. It's an easy thing. It's not hard. It's not impossible. You don't need a doctoral degree. You don't need to have anybody bless you and say, I'm going to let you listen to the Holy Spirit now. It's not a human thing. It's a God thing. And all we got to do is bring what God freely gave us into our lives. And the power of the Holy Spirit can change the world. One Spirit-filled person can change the entire world. It's an amazing thing. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word today, Lord. I thank you for the, the written word that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for the advocate that you sent. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit and all that we have received from that. Father, you love us enough that you never leave us alone. You love us enough that you never, you never stop listening. You love us enough that you never stop loving. Through your grace and peace, Lord, we are so grateful. But Lord, I also know that there are times times when I, when we block you out. There are times when we don't live the way we're supposed to be living, when we don't see the world for what the world is and see you for what who you are. There are times when we get busy, when we can't be bothered with the Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord, and we lose and we miss out on what we should be receiving from you. And Father, I just pray that each and every person who's here today, each and every person that hears these words, Lord, is fully convicted by the Spirit. Filled, shaken down and overflowing, Lord, with your Spirit and your power. And a full understanding of what that means. Lord, help us to understand the capabilities that you have provided with us, to us through the Spirit. And help us to understand, Lord, the blessings that we receive when we fully engage and participate in the life you've given us through your spirit. Father, we love you and we praise you and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.